Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Mary Maté. Thanks for being here, everybody. Great to have you with us. Very exciting show this week with uh, Columbia's Jeffrey Sachs, uh, who will be joining us to talk about the latest in the genocide in Gaza, as well as the proxy war in Ukraine, and who knows what else. So much to talk to him about. And as always, to support this show and get bonus content, including the Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness, go to our website, usefulidiotspodcast.com. A great time. Give yourself that gift. You deserve it. Well, speaking of gifts, how about those uh, four basic food groups? Oh, my God. Ready for some hearty, some hearty eating? So we got so much content for you because the Democrats do truly suck so much, as do the Republicans. Uh, for Democrats suck, let's uh, talk about Joe Biden expressing real regret, real pain about the tragic, accidental killing of six aid workers from World Central Kitchen as well as one Palestinian driver. As people probably know, Israel allegedly accidentally, we'll get into that in a second, airstruck them uh, three times, hit them three times in three separate uh, vehicles, hit one vehicle, then the people in the vehicle got out into a second car, hit that one, then they got out of that one, went to a third one, and they hit that one. And World Central Kitchen is a charity uh, headed by Jose Andres, uh, a kind of famous chef, And it had the logo of the charity on top of the car. So you had to actually see it while you were bombing it. It would have been impossible not to. So let's take a look at Biden's uh, response to this, his statement. I am outraged and heartbroken by the death of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen, including one American in Gaza yesterday. Incidents like yesterday simply should not happen. Okay, but let's take a look at this other... uh, screenshot showing what else Biden is doing besides uh, sharing words of of uh, dismay. New York Times headline, Biden administration presses Congress on $18 billion sale of F-15 jets to Israel. The deal, which would be one of the largest U.S. arms sales to Israel in years, awaits congressional approval as criticism of the war in Gaza rises. Here's another relevant headline, this one from the Washington Post. U.S. signs off on more bombs, warplanes for Israel. Despite a widening rift with the Israeli government, the Biden administration continues to authorize the transfer of 2,000-pound bombs and other weapons. And let's take a look at another headline, this one from Politico. Angry Biden not changing Israel policy after deadly strike on aid workers. Biden was privately enraged and in a public statement upbraided Israel for it, but two senior officials said that is as far as he will go for now. So as far as he will go is telling us that he's mad in secret. He's publicly upset, says incidents like this should not happen. Then he leaks it, obviously, that he's outraged. And that is about it. That's like the equivalent of thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers, mostly in private. Uh, Yeah, because I'm really mad in private. But in public, uh, I'm going to keep arming Israel to the teeth, including, you know, the headline from the Washington Post about 2000 pound bombs. Those are the bombs that Israel was getting at the start of this genocide. And then, you know, after some people pointed out, like, why are you giving this country 2000 pound bombs to drop on densely populated urban areas? Like those are kind of bombs you use for major battlefields, like in Afghanistan, you know, where you're going after like mountainous terrain. Then the administration said, oh, okay, we're going to give them smaller bombs. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That was like, a long time ago now, that was early November, smaller bombs. Of course, those smaller bombs never materialized. Uh, it's the same 2,000 pound bombs from start to finish. So nothing is changing whatsoever. Not even Israel slaughtering uh, seven aid workers, most of them from NATO states, uh, you know, uh, including from the U- including one from the U.S. Who, who was a U.S. Yeah. citizen. Doesn't change a thing. And of course, the outrage, the fact that Biden's commenting on this at all, and the fact that there's outrage is because these people, only one of them was Palestinian, but the other ones were from the West. Yeah, they're white. You know, they're white and from from Western countries. And um, that's you, you pay a higher price. I mean, you don't pay a price. Israel doesn't pay any price, as we're seeing through the policy, but you pay a public price, or I should say you pay a, you get a chiding. The price you pay is to be, um, is is to have the crime acknowledged, and then you have to pretend it was an accident. 
and you have to acknowledge it if you're Israel, as opposed to when they kill Palestinians and they just lie about it or don't mention it. So this is the most they get. Unbelievable. And, you know, many people have said that um, the reason that Israel was working with World Central Kitchen was because they wanted to be able to control the food that got into Gaza. And, of course, the United States just voted to defund UNRWA for a year. And now, after this happened, World Central Kitchen is suspending operations because it's too dangerous. So Israel gets to starve even more Palestinians. Yeah, Israel is so out of control that they'll just target anybody. Uh, and whether this is deliberate or not, it's the point is it shows just how reckless Israel is. Because say this wasn't a deliberate killing, which you know um, I can't accept because Israel, I think, is that crazy a word would even kill uh, its own partners, basically its own, uh, right. Western aid workers. But if this was a mistake, it just shows how all of Israel's claims about it, how it conducts targeted strikes, uh, it knows exactly who it's killing, is a joke. It's a complete joke, and that's why we're seeing so many people in Gaza killed, uh, so many civilians, so many children, because Israel is just reckless. It's just committing uh, outright mass murder, and so uh, it's not a surprise. It's totally consistent that Western aid workers would be among those to get hit by Israel. But uh, we're going to hear a contrary point of view, right, from none other than oh. John Kirby. Oh, yes, yes. So just before we move on to that, though, but yes, we definitely need to hear from our good friend of the show, John Kirby from the National Security Council, I would say that Israel at the best has a policy of shoot to kill, indiscriminate shoot to kill policy. And at the worst, it is discriminate. And they do both of those things. That's kind of the range of their killing. But guys, don't worry, because if you thought Joe Biden was mad, wait to hear about what John Kirby of the uh, National Security Council has to say. Well, on the point of conditions, the president on February 8th issued a memo, and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that uh, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing an investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes, at this very early hour, that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose, and there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, that we continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. They have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. So not only is he insisting that this was accidental, uh, but he's also saying that the State Department has not determined that Israel has broken any international laws throughout this entire genocidal war. Of course, he doesn't call it genocidal war. He calls it a war or a conflict. But he used the word sir uh, to the journalist who was asking questions about this. So, you know, he yes. means business. Right. I'll have right. you know, sir that our State Department has exonerated the genocidal country that we're arming. So case closed, sir. Sir. Uh, yeah, so he's serious. He he sounds like indignant that someone could yeah. possibly suggest that, uh, A, killing these aid workers when it was intentional, and B, that somehow a government that has like slaughtered tens of thousands of people, half of them children, uh, has deliberately blocked food and other aid going into Gaza He's indignant at somehow the suggestion that that's a violation of international law. That maybe yeah. somewhere in somewhere in there is a violation of international law. He's indignant. Right. He's indignant. Sir, he's so disgusting. He really is. I, I think he's the one I hate the most out of all of them. It's a tough competition. He it certainly is, yeah. he certainly is the slimiest and uh, the most he's sanctimonious. Smug. Sanctimonious. He's very smug. Yes. He's so yes. smug, yeah. Like if you look at Corinne Jean-Pierre, the White House spokesperson, she can't look up. At I least. was going to say, least. you can look at her, but she won't look at you. Exactly. Like she won't even look up because right. she's so, I think, deeply ashamed at being a right, spokesperson be. for mass murder. But John Kirby, 
He's looking people not only in the eye, he's calling them sir, and he's being indignant right. when you dare question the sanctity of Israel. And remember his award-winning performance crying over the um, killed uh, Israelis, which, of course, I'm not I'm not saying he shouldn't be upset over the killing of civilians, but uh, he had a much more tough guy attitude towards the uh, killing of Palestinians. His response to that was, this is war. This is what happens. And, of course, he was very upset over the Ukrainians. Yeah, when it comes to shedding a tear for Palestinians, he reminds me of the character Job from Rest of Development who had this line where he's like, the tears aren't coming. The tears right. aren't coming. The tears aren't coming. He couldn't find the tears, but yeah. you can certainly find the tears when it comes to crying over uh, U.S. proxies, whether it's yeah. uh, Israel or Ukraine. So, yeah, Democrats suck. So what do we got for Republicans suck? For Republicans suck, let's turn to Congress member Tim Wahlberg of Michigan who was asked by a constituent about the U.S. spending nominally some money on humanitarian aid, including building a port off of Gaza, which is presumably intended to help get aid into Gaza, although you can never fully trust Joe Biden's intentions. If Biden really wanted to get into, into Gaza, after all, he could just pressure Israel to stop blocking it right. at all the land crossings where it is. But for Tim Wahlberg, even building that port, that pier, that PR stunt that Biden's doing, even that is going too far for him. And he explained what he wants to do to Gaza instead. Are we spending our money to build a board for them? Yeah. Um, it's Joe Biden's reason. We need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. I don't think we should. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally, arguably maybe in the world, to defeat Hamas and Iran and Russia, and probably North Korea's in there and China too, with them and helping, helping uh, uh, Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over quick. Right. And in case you couldn't hear that, what he said was, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over quick. So, Aaron, what, wh how much of a um, outcrying of criticism has he faced? Surely he's been censured, right? Afraid not. Uh, you only get censured in Congress if you call for equality for Palestinians, as uh, Rashida Tlaib did when she said, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Uh, Tim Wahlberg can call for genocide on the level of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, everything's fine. Um, these people are, their racism is... There, there. I've not. I, I can't recall in my lifetime a more naked display of racism, legitimated across the political spectrum. Um, yeah. Like comments like that are just the you know among the crudest expression of it. But it's, it's, it's totally bipartisan. For example, check out this line from Aaron David Miller, who is a uh, veteran peace, so-called peace negotiator. He worked on the, under the Clinton administration. I think, he was, he, I think he served under Obama as well. And he was you know, a, a major figure in the fake peace process, which is basically pretending to maybe one day give Palestinians a state all while accelerating the Israeli colonization of the occupied West Bank. That was Aaron David Miller's job. So he was recently interviewed by The New Yorker, and he was asked about you know, whether or not he feels Joe Biden has the same level of concern for Palestinian lives as he uh, has for Israelis. And Aaron David Miller gave a very honest answer. This is what he said. Oh, if you're asking me, do I think that Joe Biden has the same depth of feeling and empathy for the Palestinians of Gaza as he does for Israelis? No, he doesn't, nor does he convey it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So what is Aaron David Miller saying there? He's saying that Joe Biden's a racist. That's what he's saying. He's saying Joe Biden's a racist bigot, just like this guy Tim Wahlberg is of the Republican Party. And that's our political spectrum from... Okay. You know, the extreme Republicans to the White House, the Democrat in the White House, they're open bigots, content to call for genocide in the case of Tim Wahlberg, in the case of Joe Biden, to actively facilitate genocide. Right. Uh, yeah. That's You're, the did, spectrum. That's the spectrum. It goes from open costs for genocide to covert um, enabling of genocide. Well, for isn't that weird? We have an interesting story. And like so many of our weirds and terribles, this is a plane based story. Uh, it could have been a terrible, but I'm going to put it on under weird. And uh, it's the story of a woman who was uh, humiliated on a Delta flight 
because apparently they were upset that she wasn't wearing a bra under her T-shirt. Um, and this was on a flight from Salt Lake City to San Francisco. And uh, let's take a look at this video in which the woman who was humiliated, who happens to be a DJ, uh, talked about what happened to her. And she's sitting next to Gloria Allred, who is a famous uh, lawyer. I was targeted and humiliated. The gate agent waited until the entire plane was seated, calm and approaching departure. She came to my seat and loudly asked to speak to me in private and escorted me off the plane as though I was a criminal. I felt I was being paraded up the aisle and in front of other passengers who might not have seen me previously. It felt like a scarlet letter was being attached to me. I felt it was a spectacle aimed at punishing me for not being a woman in the way she thought I should be a woman. I wore the same clothing any man might wear. I also have a chest smaller than many men on that flight. DJ at Kiwi is her name. She's from uh, New Zealand. She is not suing, even though she's sitting there next to a famous lawyer, Gloria Allred. She just wants to meet with the head of Delta to talk about this. I mean, there are lots of things that I find annoying that people wear, but I don't think that gives me the right to tell a Delta employee to escort them off the plane. I don't have really strong opinions about this story either way, but uh, I will say that she strikes me as uh, perhaps the world's first whistle bra -er. Nice. whistle bra -er. That's true. I like it. Yeah. Does that she work? Does it roll yeah. off the tongue? She is a, a whistle bra -er. yeah. She is a whistle bra -er. That's yeah. great. Well, that's my contribution to that. Uh, I like it. Yeah. Show. Yes. It yes. is interesting. She brought up the fact that she had a smaller chest than some men on the flight. You know, I never thought of it that way before. Just it does show a double standard. Right. So so she's saying if she has to wear a bra, then some of the men on the flight should. Right. Yeah. OK. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think she wants to live in that world. I'm hoping no. she's not actually calling for for more bras since she doesn't have to wear a bra. Hopefully she's solidaristic. And mm -hmm. if she doesn't have to wear a bra, doesn't think men should have to wear a bra. But yeah, I think she's just calling out the double standard. Well, next time I fly Delta and if Delta ever tries to pull that stunt with anybody. Uh, forcing them to wear a brassiere, I will speak out. That, you will speak out. That's my pledge. Yes. You'll blow. You'll uh, join the whistle brawers. I'll bra the whistle. I'll bra the whistle. You know what, Aaron? Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, you got kicked off of a train for asking Chris Coons about the ceasefire, right? Uh, yes, I, I yes I was. And I yeah. were you wearing, not wearing a bra at that moment? I was not wearing a bra. I can confirm that. So yeah. you may have actually been victim to this uh, <laughs> eviction policy before DJet, DJet, uh Kiwi. I never thought of it that way, but yes, you know, in which case I owe Chris Coons an apology, really, for not wearing a bra when I questioned yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. Well, what an informative segment this was. I know, oh, I learned so weird. much. Yeah. Okay. For Isn't That Terrible, let's turn to the White House. We recently commemorated the holiday of Easter. And in a really sweet, lighthearted moment, the White House press corps was treated to a podium appearance from none other than the Easter Bunny. And watch the hilarity and joy that ensues. <laughs> Are you the vice president? Are you a Are you John Kirby? <laughs> Where's your wife? <laughs> hey. oh, I, I think thumbs up. Thumbs up. Two thumbs up from the bunny. Yay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Happy Easter. <laughs> it's not even funny. I mean, it's not even good production value. They just had a bunny, a guy, a person dressed up as a bunny, hop out there, point to people as if they were calling on on people to ask questions during a press conference. Then Karine Jean-Pierre came out, did like a weird high five with the bunny. Nothing funny happened. It's very awkward. And, you know, um, you could be forgiven, I guess, if you work at the White House, to think that the White House press corps are like a bunch of children who could right. possibly be entertained by a hopping bunny. 
but you know they are yeah. actually grown adults even though they don't really act like adults because adults right. would maybe do their jobs uh and ask t tough questions rather than you know lob the softballs that the white house press corps does but yeah i mean it's like these aren't children there uh so <laughs> why they'd be entertained by a, a bunny <laughs> yeah Seems a little silly. It's, it's a little condescending, I think, to the White House press corps. If I were them, I'd feel right. a little insulted. And uh, there was a funny moment where someone asked, are you President Biden? Is it President Biden could possibly hop? Right. You know, the guy has a tough time walking. Right. So, yeah. And then Craig Jean-Pierre, again, just – it's another example of what an awkward press secretary she is. Like, right. a press secretary is supposed to enjoy lying and being phony. And she's just not – she she can't look up, as we've talked about a lot. She can't look up when she answers uh, one of her scripted questions and, for example, whitewashes Israel's genocide. And you can see it there where she gives the bunny a really awkward high five. It's just a, yes. it's an awkward display by the Easter bunny. Not only is she awkward uh, with people, but she's awkward with bunnies. There you go. She doesn't yeah. have social skills for bunnies either. Yeah. <laughs> and then someone asked if it was John Kirby, which if they if that bunny had taken off the bunny head and revealed John Kirby, that would have been the scariest thing ever. Mm. Can you imagine? That would be nightmare inducing, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, those are your four basic food groups. For this week's guest, we are joined by Jeffrey Sachs. He is a world renowned professor and author, director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. An expert in many fields with decades of experience, uh, including uh, advising the uh, Russian government after the Soviet Union and seeing firsthand the impact of U.S. policy there, which uh, he now is calling out when it comes to the proxy war in Ukraine. He's been an outspoken critic of that, also of the Israeli genocide in Gaza. And we're going to speak to Professor Sachs about those issues and a lot more. Welcome to Useful Idiots, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. We're so thrilled to have you on. I'm delighted to be with you. Thanks a lot. I want to ask you about something that you said. In November, you addressed the UN Security Council to talk about four major wars, the war in Ukraine, Syria, Israel-Palestine, and the Sahel. And you said, These wars may seem intractable, but they are not. Indeed, I would suggest that all four wars could be ended quickly by agreement within the UN Security Council. Is that still your assessment? And if so, how would that happen? I think we always should refer back to von Clausewitz, who said that war is the continuation of politics with other means. And what he meant by that is that wars reflect political disagreements. And so you end wars not on the battlefield typically, or and you shouldn't, but rather through solving the politics. This is true in Ukraine. It's certainly true uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine uh, and so forth. So yes, I take that position. And if the Security Council would uh, act in a proper way, uh, it could end all of these wars very, very quickly. If you, if you, if you want me to elaborate, uh, yeah. you know, one sentence on, on uh, Ukraine is this is a war over NATO enlargement. It, it always has been. It remains so till today. I just saw that uh, Secretary of State Blinken said again today that uh, Ukraine will become part of NATO. Well, it'll, it, it, it may uh, disappear before that happens. Russia is not going to have it happen for completely understandable reasons. Uh, and uh, Blinken's statement just shows how, in my view, how imbecilic uh, U.S. foreign policy has been for decades uh, over this. And this war has now been going on for 10 years. Uh, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, uh, the issue has been staring us in the face, in my view, for 57 years, which is uh, there need to be two states. Uh, they don't have to like each other. Uh, they need to be separated from each other. Uh, but my recommendation in the Security Council was and is immediately recognize uh, the state of Palestine as the 194th UN member state on the 4th of June 1967 borders. Do that. Do that today. Uh, and then uh, we uh, don't have a mystery of a so-called peace process, which is 
phony and never going to happen. Uh, we know what the boundaries are, and uh, then we can get to a few remaining practicalities. Uh, so uh, those uh, wars, pretty clear what the politics is about. The politics of the Sahel is also quite clear, extreme impoverishment. Uh, extreme impoverishment uh, with uh, a Western world that could care less about extreme impoverishment. Uh, so this is uh, a another case where uh, even a modest development uh, strategy would change everything for these absolutely impoverished uh, landlocked countries in Western Africa. And when it comes to Syria, we know exactly where the war came from. It came from the Oval Office of the United States uh, and uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Uh, one day, Obama and Clinton said, OK, uh, we have to overthrow uh, the government of Syria. That was back in 2011. Mind boggling, but typical, typical of the U.S. Uh, we get to choose which country, uh, who's going to rule other countries. Uh, this is one of you know around 100 regime change operations of the U.S. since the end of World War II. And it, like most of them, it failed incredibly. Uh, but to this day, we continue with our uh, military presence, with our troops, with uh, trying to undermine the Syrian government. So again, this is politics about the most mind-bogglingly stupid of all of them, though, because this really was a willful decision just to overthrow a government in 2011, not even for any obvious, obvious reason, however bad, but just that they decided from a certain point, well, this guy we got to take out and uh, assign the CIA to do it. So these are wars that reflect underlying politics that is pretty messed up. Most of it I trace back to the United States, uh, you know, when you're trying to be the world's hegemon. Uh, you're trying to do something which is uh, completely delusional, and, and that is the nature of U.S. foreign policy. You know, there's a very famous clip of you from Morning Joe on MSNBC uh, laying out what you just did about the dirty war in Syria. And we know uh, they sent in the CIA to overthrow Assad. The CIA and Saudi Arabia together uh, in covert operations tried to overthrow Assad. It was a disaster. Eventually, it brought in both ISIS as a splinter group to the jihadists that went in. It also brought in Russia. So we have been digging deeper and deeper and deeper. What we should do now is get out. And I believe that's one of the few times, if not maybe the only time on U.S. corporate television in the last decade when those facts were allowed to be said. I'm just curious, have you been allowed back on MSNBC since then? Do you, do you remember? I, w I was allowed back on since then, but I haven't been allowed on uh, since uh, since Ukraine. That's okay. for sure. <laughs> All right. And and uh, and uh, my my last mainstream, I think my last mainstream appearance on uh, U.S. Uh, television media was on Bloomberg when I said, uh, "Yeah, the U.S. probably blew up uh, Nord Stream," and uh, they took me off the air literally within thirty seconds, and uh, never. Once more, did I hear an invitation from anybody that had normally asked me on, I'd say, every two weeks to every four weeks, whether it was Morning Joe or Tom Keen on, uh, on Bloomberg or any place else. It's a complete shutdown. OK, I'm, I'm not suffering from it, but it's pathetic. Uh, and it's a complete shutdown uh, in the mainstream print media. I can't get in 700 words, and that's online, you know, when it's you're not exactly limited on the New York Times, uh, when they have said everything like three-year-olds about the Ukraine war. I, I don't know whether they're as stupid and ignorant as they sound or whether they're just simply directed from above. But I ask at one point, give me just 700 words. Let me say why you're incessant inanity that this is an unprovoked war need, needs a little bit of uh, qualification. And uh, after weeks and weeks of going around, uh, begrudgingly, the editor said, okay, 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 okay. So I sent the piece, it got edited, it got put into uh, New York Times font, everything. I was, oh, I was chortling. 
I did it. I got through. I got it. And then I got an email from uh, a junior editor. Uh, well, so sorry, Professor Sachs. We're not going to be able to run your piece. So uh, that was uh, th that that was in uh, 2023. And then uh, a few weeks ago, just to uh, finish uh, th this bizarre world, a uh, uh, New York Times editor reached out to me and said, you know, we'd be interested in your thoughts about uh, Pakistan and the Pakistan elections. Okay, so I wrote, uh, I think shouldn't have been surprising for them that it wasn't a great idea for the U.S. to uh, uh, help to overthrow Imran Khan. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Sachs, we can't have that in our pages. <laughs> and so, okay, this is uh, how it is. And weren't you also hushed up, like silenced when you talked about, I think, the U.S. or Britain? You talked about Western violence or Western imperialism, and you were interrupted. That was another time that you were. That was in a uh, democracy forum of the New York Times. You can be democratic at home and ruthlessly imperial abroad. The most violent country in the world since 1950 has been the United States. It's Jeff, been by let's, far involved Jeffrey, in more stop wars, now. In more let's, wars. let's, For Jeffrey, I, I'm, I'm Jeffrey, I'm your moderator, and it's enough. Okay, I'm done. I, I forgive the moderator uh, a little bit because I was probably running on a little too long. But in any event, I think uh, also the content was probably a little annoying to the sponsors. It's sort of like, you know, we only get uh, the U.S. government to admit to taking part in coups 50 years after the fact. So, for example, the, the CIA coup in Iran in 1953, we're still learning about that. So I figured that the New York Times probably is on the same pace. As soon as the U.S. government finally admits something, 50 years later, they'll let you write about it. So in 50 years, Professor Sachs, I'm sure we'll be getting your op-eds on you. I've, I've got my piece already, you know. <laughs> no, it's it's so amazing, by the way. Uh, it's fascinating. We, we need to dissect this whole uh, term of covert operations because they're basically in broad daylight. Covert doesn't mean hidden. Covert just means denied uh, in full view. Uh, and so we have repeatedly events uh, like coups and overthrows and blowing up pipelines. And they just say, no, nah, didn't didn't happen. Uh, you know, I'll tell you another example of this. Uh, I was uh, briefly, uh, well, I was friends with the Aristide in Haiti, uh, and I briefly was trying to help him uh, in an absolutely impoverished place that needs help. Needed help, needs help. And he said to me, uh, Jeff, they're, they're going to take me out. They're going to take me out. Uh, and I said, oh, no, no, Mr. President, relax. We're going to take care of this. You know, pretty stupid and naive, I have to say, of, of myself. Uh, but I said, no, no, it's OK. We're going to work this out and so forth. Well, then, of course, uh, this is uh, George W. Uh, Bush Jr., uh, they cut off Haiti from IMF, World Bank, all the usual things for destabilization before the CIA finally moves in, often literally for the kill, or at least figuratively for the kill in the overthrow. Then one day, they, you know, the U.S. ambassador walks in and guides uh, Aristide out to a plane with uh, the unmarked tail, and 23 hours later, he's in Central Africa. Okay, this is what is known as a coup, uh, a, a CIA coup. So I, I know the uh, reporter that covers this beat in the New York Times, and I call her, and I said the next day, you're, you're not going to cover the coup. Uh, they walked the president out to an unmarked uh, tail, and, uh, fly him out to Central. You're not. And she said, uh, Jeff, the, the editor's not interested. That's, that's, that's all, all the news that's fit to print. Yeah. And uh, then I was, you know, America is a surreal place. The, the uh, next Monday or Tuesday, I was testifying in Congress on a hearing where everyone was saying how they loved Haiti uh, and, uh, you know, would do everything and, and how good it was that the U.S. had protected uh, the president of Haiti from harm's way because uh, there were belligerents that were coming to attack him. 
And then, of course, everything is completely forgotten in the next hour, and that's the end of it. So yeah. this is uh, typical for how things uh, act right now. And if you act with this impunity, if there is no accountability, the recklessness, the stupidity, uh, really the imbecility of it uh, continues to expand. And that's where we are today. And it's extraordinarily dangerous because not only are we doing terrible things, but we're doing delusional things like uh, Blinken saying, uh, we are going to uh, uh, make sure that uh, NATO enlarges to Ukraine as uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are dying on, on the battlefield. And we have no way, plan, shape uh, or decency. <laughs> I mean, the whole idea is mistaken, but no way to do that. But what we are doing is guaranteeing that the war will continue. And, and by the way, just speaking of Haiti, uh, the 20th anniversary of that coup was just uh, in February. Uh, and we're still yep. learning about it. France's ambassador at the time recently, a few years ago, admitted that the, France and the U.S. orchestrated that coup uh, against Aristide. And by the way, that was the second time Aristide was overthrown in a U.S.-backed coup. Yeah, and, and by the way, I was at uh, part diplomatic gatherings where people were bragging about this afterwards. Ugh. The Belgians, the French, you know, laughing about this stuff. And look at Haiti now. It's it's, it's the sen- it's. It's descended into such absolute chaos, and yet nobody can trace it back to our critical role in destabilizing the country by overthrowing its first popularly elected president. You look all around the world, these actions destabilize places for decades, for generations. They're based on violence, uh, imbecility, and lies. They uh, suborn local leaders. They distort everything about local politics. Uh, And of course, there's zero accountability for the United States. And the legacy of this, look at Brzezinski's brilliant move of uh, putting uh, jihadists into Afghanistan in 1979. We're still now 45 years later, uh, a country completely destroyed for two generations almost no understanding in the United States at all, uh, almost no connecting the dots of how this CIA operation back in 1979 has led step by step by step to unending chaos. Look at Iran, uh, which you mentioned, 1953, overthrowing a democratically elected government because somehow weirdly our oil had gotten under their sand, as they say. Uh, And uh, we've done this in so many places. And the legacy of it, uh, Libya, Syria, more recently, Ukraine is the same way. Uh, It poisons politics, even for generations, because it's violent. It's so stupid in its direction, so arrogant and wrongheaded. It's done covertly so-called, because what is being done is so far from what should be done that it's hidden and deniable from view. And so it's horrible policies done in a way guaranteed to poison the politics of these places for decades. You know, when I go to Southeast Asia, which is quite frequently, there are places today you do large, lots of places you do not walk because the unexploded ordinance of America's secret wars are all over the farmlands uh, in Laos, in Cambodia, until today. The U.S. government, by the way, is still trying to collect debt from a regime that it installed in place, destabilized the entire country, lent it money for emergency food aid, bombed the place relentlessly and is trying to get repaid till today. Speaking of coups, you, of course, have traced the current war in Ukraine back to uh, 2014, and you say that the United States helped create that coup. Of course. And you were there. uh, You said you saw things up close, uh, certain things up close and and personal. Can you talk about some of the things that you were able to see because of your involvement in that region that others weren't able to see? I mean, uh, you know, the one thing that I saw was that um, immediately after 
the coup, I was called by the new government. I didn't know what had happened, but the prime minister said, I'd like to meet with you to discuss this economic crisis. And so I had advised the uh, government in uh, Ukraine back in uh, the early 1990s. And of course, the prime minister asked me and I went. And when I went, uh, I was taken around the Maidan where people were still milling around. And the American NGOs were around there. And they were describing to me, oh, we paid for this. We paid for that. We funded this insurrection. It turned my stomach, by the way. I had my meeting, got on the plane, went home, and that was the end of that. But I saw the bragging. Now, U.S. NGOs funding this uprising, they didn't do that on their own as nice NGOs. This is, uh, let's just say, off-budget financing for a U.S. regime change operation. And then uh, the Russians did us a, a good favor of helping us to understand what this was all about because they intercepted the call between Victoria Newland and, uh, and Jeffrey Piat, who was then the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, describing how they were going to put Yatsenuk, the prime minister, into power. This was weeks before. But they had already chosen him as the new prime minister. And he's the guy that called me uh, to ask me. You know, of course, I didn't know anything about this call at the time. But you can listen to it. And there it's the plotting. And by the way, how bizarre it is. It's online. Thank you to the Russian government for intercepting it, uh, giving us some insight into what the U.S. government does. And not a word of explanation from the U.S. from that date on. And basically, where the reporters in the White House pool or in the State Department pool on any given day from February 2014 until today asking about that. And if they did, of course, they'd get that, that indelible smirk <laughs> of Admiral Kirby uh, or of uh, Matt Miller, who can't even lie with a straight face because they're having such a good time with their idiocy. Uh, but they would deny that there ever was such a phone call. And it would be online and they would say, no, it doesn't exist. Uh, yes, but uh, Mr. Miller, it's right there. No, sorry, it just doesn't exist. And that's uh, and the New York Times would say there were unfounded allegations uh, that a call existed uh, and it was uh, linked to the following website, but this website obviously doesn't exist. That's how the New York Times would report it if it covered it at all. The, the counter argument you will get or that I get from people who support the proxy war in Ukraine about the Newland call is that Newland was not plotting uh, the overthrow of the government. Newland was trying to work out who should serve with Yanukovych, who was then the current president, who Newland was trying to overthrow in a power sharing government. Because it is true that at the time Yanukovych offered the opposition in a bid to defuse the Maidan crisis, a power sharing deal. So Newland and Piet were just doing their part to plot about who should come in and serve alongside Yanukovych. The problem with that, first of all, is that uh, on the call, it shows that Newland and Piet are picking who should serve in government. So exactly. Just, it shows. Even, even if that's the interpretation, yeah. it's the U.S. is making a government, for yeah. God's sake. Come yes, on. Yeah. And then that same made on movement that where they're deciding who should be the leaders are they uh, ultimately the hardcore nationalist component of that made on movement rejected the power sharing agreement, launched a coup with violence. Uh, and without a sufficient quorum in parliament, installed a new government and put Yatsenyuk, who Newland had selected, as a new leader. So, of course. And by know, the way, uh, within 24 hours, recognized by the United States. Exactly. Contrary to an agreement that was reached. This yeah. is what's called a coup. Yeah. So uh, whether it went exactly as was uh, expected on around, uh, I think, January 27th or so when this call uh, was made. We don't. I don't know the date exactly. It's unclear. I think it was posted in, uh, yeah. or claimed to be. Uh, BBC covers it uh, as if it's in, in early February. Yeah. But whatever it is, it's obnoxious as it is completely. <laughs> Not Klitschko. We've got Yatsenuk. Yats is the guy. We're going to bring in. Uh, we're going to bring in the big guy. That means Biden uh, to do the attaboy uh, on this. So, the United States is making the government of Ukraine, excuse me. <laughs> so that's a coup, by the way. 
And then when you find out that the Maidan was paid for, paid for by the U.S., okay, that's a, another piece of it. And yeah. then, of course, I would love for the CIA to uh, show us the books and tell us what really happened. And now that Victoria Newland is my incoming colleague at Columbia University, I'm sure Awkward. she's going to. I'm sure she's going to give a seminar explaining all of the details of this. So I'll let you know what we hear in the Maybe seminar. Maybe she'll, she'll give a baking seminar about how to make those cookies. <laughs> she may she well do out. so. <laughs> well, listen, we've, we've covered some really important historical context, but let's turn to some of the present calamities. Uh, it's hard to know where to start. Yeah, where to start, right. Let me actually begin by asking you about Israel's strike on Syria recently, because they attacked the Iranian embassy in Damascus, uh, killing a very senior commander with the IRGC. Uh, what do you think Israel's goal was here? And, and, and what do you make of, you know, this new line being crossed, you know, bombing a diplomatic facility, which, you know, according to international law is actually the sovereign territory of the country that inhibits it. So basically, of Israel is basically bombing Iran by doing this. Well, I, I think the line that Israel has really crossed is committing a genocide with the, the cameras rolling uh, and uh, saying that we do so with complete impunity. Uh, and if the UN Security Council calls for an immediate ceasefire, we ignore that uh, entirely. Today's uh, explanation of uh, the bombing of, uh, uh, of, of the uh, food uh, relief uh, operations uh, was uh, AI systems uh, automatically uh, targeting thousands and thousands of uh, deaths and murder, knowing Israeli startups, that could uh, well be the case. Uh, but Israel has crossed so many lines uh, in this. Uh, it's a completely rogue operation. It's in complete violation of the 1948 Genocide Convention of the Geneva Codes of the UN Charter. One doesn't know where to start, but sending a missile uh, into Iranian uh, diplomatic uh, territory is uh, attempting to widen the war. I think the Israeli government is uh, extremely eager that their vassal state, uh, also known as the United States, uh, will join in a war against Iran. So I think the intention is to widen the war. What are the real intentions when you talk about hegemony, for instance, what does that mean in real concrete terms? Like, what does the U.S. want when it bleeds Russia? The U.S. wants to be in a situation that no government in the world opposes U.S. policies on anything, whether it's on economics or natural resource disposition or locations of pipelines uh, or, of course, uh, locations of military forces or governments that might tax U.S. companies, anything that the U.S. would oppose, uh, the U.S. wants a subservient government. That's what hegemony means. Hegemony means uh, that you have a government that will do the U.S. bidding. And this is carried out uh, basically by the archipelago of U.S. military forces uh, around the world it's estimated that between 800 and 900 military bases in 80 countries of the world. So uh, the U.S. Uh, basically, even in effect, occupies many of these countries. It seems strange, but when you have the U.S. military bases there, the governments are afraid to move against the U.S., uh, often for some pretty obvious reasons, but even, even friendly uh, allied governments, even Japan, they're afraid of the U.S. Uh, and uh, it's a strange idea. It seems like an alliance, but it's not quite like that. So the U.S. wants to make sure that no one crosses the U.S. And what this means is that any large country is inherently an affront to U.S. hegemony. And two in particular right now, but there's a third one that will come this way, uh, are affronts to the U.S. Russia's too big for the U.S. and China's too big for the U.S. And so we hate them. We hate them because everything they do, we interpret in a way to generate the public hatred and fear. And so 
this is, by the way, uh, the out of the playbook of the British Empire, which was really the uh, tutor of the American Empire, because Britain uh, did all of this in the 19th century, what the United States started doing in the second half of the 20th century. Britain came to hate Russia in the 1840s, so much so that when Russia got into a tiff with the Ottoman Empire in 1850, uh, the, the Brits stepped forward and said, time to invade Russia. Uh, and that was the Crimean War, which was 1853 to 1856. Very similar dynamics. By the way, this is the second Crimean War. It's almost to, to the playbook because the idea of the first Crimean War was surround Russia in the Black Sea, uh, deny Russia's access to uh, its uh, naval base in Sevastopol. Uh, same story as today. Uh, same words you hear from MI6, from uh, the British, uh, from the Ukrainians, we're going to attack Crimea. It's exactly <laughs> the, the repeat of 1853. But what was the reason for Russophobia of uh, Britain in the 1840s? Well, it wasn't communism. It wasn't Putin. It, it wasn't uh, any of that. It was Russia was so big that it was an affront to British hegemony. And the crazy idea back in the 1840s, which moved public opinion, was the idea that Russia was going to invade India from Central Asia through the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan and take over Britain's crown jewel of empire. Of course, completely fantastical. It had absolutely nothing to do with what the czars wanted to do, with what Russia was capable or wanted to do, but it drove war. And this is what we have today, which is America asserts its right of control over everybody. They call it literally primacy or full spectrum dominance, uh, or I, we call it uh, hegemony. Uh, but whichever term one uses, the countries that are an affront to that are the enemy. And I mentioned that there's a third one. Right now, the U.S. is angling that India will be on our side against China. But India is a big civilization and country. And you can pretty much imagine the U.S. Uh, coming to see India as this great threat. Not today, 10 years, 20 years. It's, it's a dynamic which is absolutely awful. And by the way, uh, just to put put the scholarly uh, gloss on it, uh, uh, John Mearsheimer, uh, whom I'm uh, uh, very good friends with and I uh, admire a lot but disagree with very strongly on uh, a core principle, wrote a book uh, called uh, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. It's his great realist uh, foreign policy book of 2001. Um, and he wrote at the beginning, uh, we have good relations with China right now, but they will worsen. And uh, and he called it, by the way. You know, he called it entirely. I said at the time, why should they worsen? We have no, we have no trouble. No, no, they're going to worsen. Why are they going to worsen? Because China is going to become a major power. I said, yeah, okay, so. No, 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 because then they'll worsen because then it's going to be a threat. He said, John, it's not a threat unless we make it a threat. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. He said, yeah, yeah. Right. He said, John, we got to stop the self-fulfilling prophecy. He says, you can't. So that's the difference of uh, the realists and me is I believe we could actually talk with each other and find peaceful approaches. But the point is hegemony means we control what we want to control, where we want to control it. We control which governments operate if a government is not to our taste, we replace it with war or with a covert regime change operation or some other subterfuge of the National Endowment of Democracy or some NGO that uh, uh, does uh, the politics for us. That's what hegemony means. As we're recording this, uh, Joe Biden has just had a phone call with Netanyahu and White House aides are doing the, the familiar dance of 
leaking to the press that Biden is angry, he's fuming, even though we've just gotten news from the Washington Post that on the same day that Israel killed those aid workers with the World Central Kitchen, Biden uh, uh, sent uh, thousands more bombs to Israel. So that's an indication of how angry Biden is, claiming he's angry while sending Israel more bombs. But the White House has just put out a statement, you know, suggesting, I think for the first time, that they might condition their support for Israel on Israel's conduct, specifically with how it addresses civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. Uh, The White House statement says that Biden made clear, quote, that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. So they're saying now for the first time that they're going to actually shape their policy with consideration of how Israel acts. So they're going to actually tie their policy to Israel's actual conduct. We'll see if they actually do that. But here is White House spokesperson John Kirby speaking about this at the White House. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. That was really fascinating. So insightful. So, I feel so blessed to have spoken to uh, Dr. Sachs. A lot covered there. And uh, it's great getting into history. The problem is there's just so much to cover that it's yeah. hard to know uh, what to focus on because there's just so many disasters going on in the world right now. But few people are better equipped than Jeffrey Sachs to break it all down. So very grateful to him. Very grateful to you, our audience, for tuning in and supporting the show, which if you're not already a member, we suggest you think about it, consider it, go to usefulidiotspodcast.com, support the show, get bonus content, including the extended version of this interview with Jeffrey Sachs. Where we talk about all sorts of interesting things, including the obsession with TikTok. And again, that's usefulidiotspodcast.com. See you there. See you next time. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.